In this lesson, we're going to take a detour and have a look at the computational theory of mind. Now, this is very important when we're looking at computer simulations. And we're going to start to really outline just how difficult it's going to be to really kind of come to any kind of definitive answer regarding uh, computer simulations. So we're going to outline and explain the computational theory of mind. We're going to look at how it relates to computer simulations. And then we're going to look at criticism. But then we're going to explain why the criticism doesn't really solve the problem or show anything that we don't already know. So fundamentally, what is the computational theory of mind? It's the idea that the mind is like a computational system. It's a way we can represent understanding of the mind. We can think of the idea that the mind thinks like a computer. Okay, We can describe the workings of the mind as almost like an information processing system. And uh, so therefore, computationalism is the theory that cognition is a form of computation, that our brains work like a computer. And if our brains work like a computer, then how does this how is this really relevant to the simulation argument? Well, if we think back to the first criticism of the simulation argument, we find that it was attacked on the grounds that it may not be able to simulate consciousness. That was the first that was the first criticism and it was really the main criticism of the simulation argument because it suggested that well the idea of there being a simulation that is indistinguishable from the real world is actually impossible because a computer cannot ever simulate consciousness. But we know that simulations are able to simulate physical objects accurately. If you look at CGI in movies and stuff, we can see that we can simulate whole worlds with relative accuracy. But what the argument that was saying is we can't simulate consciousness. But so yeah, is it ever ever possible to simulate consciousness in the same way as we simulate uh, you know a volcano or something okay <clears throat> well if we accept the computational theory of mind then yes we obviously can because the computational theory of mind states that the mind is just like a computer and so it can be represented just like a computer and if we can describe the mind like a computer system then it's perfectly possible to simulate it in the same way as we simulate physical objects. We can simulate computer systems within simulations. So if the mind is just a uh, just a more complex uh, form of computer, then we can simulate the mind and therefore simulate consciousness. So therefore, it's crucial for establishing a theoretical possibility for a simulated reality. So what started out as possibly the main criticism of the simulation argument can be shown to be false, can be shown to be, you know, not entirely that convincing when we accept the computational theory of mind. So all we've got to do now is accept the computational theory of mind. And that's where we start looking at the criticisms. So one main criticism comes from this gentleman here, John Searle. And um, this is known as the Chinese room argument. And it's something we touched on in the uh, lessons on AI in a lot more detail, but I'm going to go over it briefly here because what the Chinese room argument states is that it is impossible for a computer to be artificially intelligent, to possess strong artificial intelligence. And he argues by using this thought experiment, which is the Chinese room argument. So the idea is imagine we we have a room with a human in the room a human being in the room an english speaking person in the room with a bunch of chinese characters like the letters in chinese and an instruction book for how to put those characters together now imagine if somebody who was chinese was to post a letter in Chinese through the door in the room they don't know who's in the room or what's in the room or anything they just post a letter through the door that is Chinese the person in the Chinese room okay will then use the instruction books that the instruction book is in English the English instruction book to find the characters that's on the letter and to um, create an appropriate response Okay, the instructions tell him how to uh, respond in Chinese. He then p 
passes a, a letter back and that is a response and to the people who are speaking chinese outside the chinese room they think that whoever or whatever is in that room can speak and understand chinese because they're having a conversation in chinese however we wouldn't say that the english speaking person has any understanding of chinese because all they're doing is manipulating the symbols using an instruction manual and that is what effectively is john searle's argument he's suggesting that computers work in a very similar way because there is no way all a computer is doing is simulating consciousness simulating uh, an, a, an image of um, of artificial intelligence because they're just manipulating the symbols they're not actually simulating intelligence so therefore the idea that it could simulate consciousness in a way that was indistinguishable from actual consciousness is very um, unconvincing and also the idea because simply all they're doing is manipulating symbols and you know using instructions to uh, appear as if they are conscious however this does have some criticisms when we're talking about the simulation argument well uh, in general there are criticisms of the chinese room argument but i think some of you would have touched on the fact that all we're trying to do is simulate consciousness in a way that is indistinguishable from um you know from the real world and to the chinese speakers outside the room the person who is inside the room is speaking chinese in a way that is indistinguishable from somebody who actually understands the language so even if a computer can only simulate um intelligence and therefore you know consciousness or anything like that by manipulating symbols and using syntax rather than semantic understanding then arguably that's fine because if all they're doing is if it's indistinguishable from real world it doesn't matter how they got there as long as it is simulating consciousness indistinguishably so that's a criticism of Searle's argument that's a criticism of Searle's argument when we apply it to the idea of um, a simulated consciousness because Searle argues against the computational theory of mind and the idea that a mind um, can be like a computer and a computer can be like a mind there are criticisms with John Searle's argument in general and you can have a look at those if you go over to my course on the philosophy of artificial intelligence but when it comes to the idea of consciousness Searle doesn't seem to be saying anything if anything Searle seems to be um, supporting the view that a computer can simulate consciousness in a way that is indistinguishable from anything you know that is in the real world because what he is saying effectively is that all a computer does is give the impression or sorry all that he can do in the chinese room is give the impression that he's speaking chinese but if that's indistinguishable when you know when the chinese speakers are are speaking to him then that is effectively test uh, you know uh, passing the test for the idea of us being in a simulated reality so the criticisms aren't particularly strong the criticism here by the by john searle isn't particularly strong in this case you could also say that it doesn't really disprove anything about at least some part of of our world being simulated if we cannot simulate consciousness let's assume for now that the computational theory of mind is false and it has been debunked so we can't simulate consciousness which is which is fine but does that mean that we still can't be living in a simulation this brings us to the question of the idea of our brain in a vat the brain in the vat argument the argument that we cannot be in a simulation because we cannot simulate consciousness doesn't explain why we cannot be in a, a conscious brain in a vat with the environment around us being simulated so we may be able to reject the notion that we are completely simulated this is we're completely simulated but we can't reject the idea that our brain with our conscious physical brain is just in a vat and we are simulating uh, and and something is simulating the rest of the world does that make sense that makes sense to everybody so 
even if we reject the idea that you know Bostrom's uh, quite strong notion that we're all in a simulation on the basis that a, a computer cannot simulate consciousness and if we reject the computational theory of mind that states that um, we could simulate consciousness if we reject both of those we still cannot reject the idea that we are a brain in a vat that is a conscious physical brain that has consciousness and that the things that we can simulate like the physical world cgi or whatever is what's being simulated and it also doesn't rule out the idea that we're all just dreaming because that's a, a similar kind of state to being a brain in a vat the conscious brain is is dreaming we cannot reject any of these ideas and so really we have to go a bit deeper so in summary the main critique of the simulation argument may never be able to simulate consciousness okay but this critique can be solved if we accept the computational theory of mind. However, even if we don't accept the computational theory of mind, which, you know, there are debates for and against that, we could still just be a brain in a vat. Or we could just be bre uh, could, uh, could just be dreaming. Which brings us to our next lesson, which is, are we all just dreaming? The dream argument, okay? And this is really, we're getting into the sort of circular reasoning that goes behind this idea of, of of being a simulation i think you'll get to the point where you really realize that we can't actually ever know if we're dreaming or not or if we're in a simulation or not 